Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme, who is blocking Turkey's plans to join the EU? Richard Dawkins on God and evolution and where we all came from. Chef Heston Blumenthal and the latest from Iran as well. But first of all, the Sri Lankan government is on a collision course with the United Nations over the fate of 300,000 people displaced in the fighting between the army and the Tamil Tigers. The UN accuses the government of effectively trapping people in the refugee camps and of appalling human rights violations. Journalists complain that they're not allowed into the camps and stories are rife of malnutrition and, and maltreatment. With me right now is the Sri Lanka's permanent secretary to the minister responsible for human rights. He's the permanent secretary and Rajiva Wajay Singha is here right now. The basic question, I suppose, is at the moment, before getting into any detail, is why, I mean, people around the world are saying about your land, uh, why won't you let journalists and, uh, and indeed UN people into these camps for 300,000 people? You must have something to hide, otherwise you let the journalists in. You're familiar with this argument, but, but why, why, unless you have something to hide, why not let the journalists in? Well, the point is we do let them in. Um, I think we are a bit confused when we talk about journalists and UN. The UN is there. It's working. It uh, does not have what Western journalists describe as free access, but they're there all the time. They work in partnership with us, for instance, on the main issue of what's called protection, which is the one area in which my ministry has an operational function. We work together with them. And that perhaps answers your question about the journalists. I was amongst those who fought very hard for relatively free access for journalists in March and so on. And the government did allow many people in, and I'm happy to say that many of them behaved admirably. A lot of Indian journalists went in, I think, contributed to people realizing things were much better than was pointed out. The BBC had some negative things, but always asked us to comment. But unfortunately, Al Jazeera, I have to say, was very good indeed. But unlike in financiers, bad journalism drives out the good. And we had a spate of very bad reports, including from Channel 4, which never consulted us. We had someone in The Guardian claiming that 13 women had been found with slit throats. I actually had a meeting of our protection group and asked whether any NGO, we had about 12 NGOs working in there, so they, they do have access. I said, is there any reason for this? They said, none whatsoever. So I'm sorry, but a lot of false reporting has led to the government saying, if this is the way people react, we have to be careful about journalists. Journalists are allowed in. The BBC guy wrote about traveling through the camps last week. But there are restrictions. I'm sorry about them. But I think you have to realize that a government trying to do its best in a difficult situation can't distinguish between 90% of objective journalists and the very few who have been deliberately driven by a political agenda. But it, it take, for instance, the, the UN. There's two things that have come up, isn't there? One is the UN saying it cannot continue to indefinitely fund the main refugee camp in Sri Lanka where the government's keeping nearly 300,000 people and they're still screening everybody and they it may take up to a year to complete it. And they say as many people as possible should leave as soon as possible. The UN are not happy with this situation, are they? Well, I'm so glad you used the word they cannot fund indefinitely because we know that. This morning I was at uh, another TV station who said the UN said they cannot any longer fund. That's not true. What Neil Buna said is very clear. We can't fund indefinitely. We agree with that when you talk of people saying clear the camps. My ministry have prepared memos and suggested ways in which they can be decongested. Um, and it, perhaps it's slower than people want, but we do have security considerations. And neither you nor I can second guess the Ministry of Defense in a context in which we had a really appalling terrorist group, which had got its tentacles everywhere. We need to be careful. But what we do argue, and this I think is in accordance with international practice, is that unless there are good reasons for people to be kept, we should move quickly towards returns and release. But we do recognize that many of them want to leave, and we have to uh, fast forward this. But there was this other thing from the UN. A UN spokeswoman in New York said the world body was extremely concerned about two of its Sri Lankan staff members arrested in June near the camp, still in detention, and the, there were allegations that they had been mistreated at the hands of the authorities. 
Well, that, when that first came up, my ministry did investigate. They were said to have been abducted, but the police had taken them in. I'm afraid there is fairly strong evidence that they had been involved in certain activities they shouldn't have been involved in. Of course, we do recognize that tigers sometimes applied pressure on people and made them do things. And because these people worked for the UN, they were particularly uh, subject to pressure from the tigers. But we cannot, simply because they work for the UN, assume that therefore they are innocent. We have had examples before. For instance, about two years ago, as the UN sec arrived, I was at a meeting with him, and he suddenly got up and said, I can't, you know. It couldn't have come at a worse moment. One of my chaps was found with a pistol pen. And I'm afraid if people working for the UN are going around with weapons, we have to take them into, into custody, but we've kept the UN informed about these things. So we have to recognize that within the UN, while the senior members are trying to do a very good job indeed, some of the youngsters see themselves as, you know, white knights crusading against what they see as a wicked government, and they damage relations. Looking at this situation uh, from afar as well, it would seem to us, to people in this country and so on, that you are in danger of missing a great opportunity for healing of the people by detaining people longer than necessary by having these other stories and complaints coming up. Don't you think you're in, you're in danger of missing the boat in terms of persuading the world that this is a just regime? I think you're right. There are great dangers. But can I say we also object to selective reporting? For instance, we talk of the 10,000 who had fought for the Tigers. We are doing our best with them. We recognize most of them were forced to. If I might point out, I mean, these are girls who three months ago or six months ago would have killed me if I'd gone there. This is them in the camp. You can see that they're perfectly nice young ladies who want to have fun in life and learn to do better. This is are the schools. People, when they saw this, said, you mean the little kids have uniforms? These are the preschool kids. We have provide education in there. We conducted the advanced level examination. We are doing our best for them. Uh, one of the things we found was that particularly in the last year, and there's a collection of our, our, our articles, a lot of British papers, perhaps under pressure from Tiger um, pressure groups, we know that some MPs are in fear of losing their seats. They've been threatened that the Tamils who support the Tigers will not vote for them. That's been said very clearly. They have actually been engaging in propaganda even worse. You know, I have absolutely every sympathy for Tamils who suffered in the past who are bitter, but the British MPs are doing it for electoral gain. And we find that embarrassing. It's really particularly bad in this country, perhaps because of our long colonial ties. But there is a lot of, let's say, prejudice. And while lots of negative things are there, which we need to improve, there is no recognition of the positive. Thank you very much indeed for being with us and uh, putting your, your uh, point of view so forcefully. We really thank you for, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Frost. It's been a pleasure. We'll, we'll be back in a moment. Three months ago, it was all over the news. Now, what's happening in Iran? Join me after this short break.